All right, Hebrews chapter number 6, and as I've mentioned a couple of times, I'm pretty excited about this evening's service, about specifically preaching through this particular chapter of the book of Hebrews. Now, uh, just a couple of quick statements to summarize some of the key points that are going to be found in this chapter. Now, the overall summary, if I had to give you a summary within a statement, within a couple of words of Hebrews chapter number 6, is endurance for the Christian. It is about a Christian enduring, or more specifically, a Christian enduring and growing in the faith. And you're going to see that in the context before and after some very uh, you know, uh, controversial or debated verses. There's also a couple of verses here, maybe five, six verses, that there is a lot of debate about. There's a lot of different interpretations. There's a lot of different you know, uh, uh, opinions on what these particular scriptures are teaching. And I believe that, of course, my interpretation is correct. And I'm going to give you my interpretation. And you can decide whether or not you believe that or you think that that is true. I'm going to be comparing scripture with scripture. We're going to be doing internally within the book of Hebrews, looking at a couple of scriptures without the book of Hebrews. But uh, this is a very, very uh, uh, important chapter. And, and really, it... it, uh, it really bonds the consistency of a lot of the other things that we've been going through. And that is, uh, there are many, many chapters or many passages, if you will, within the book of Hebrews that people will try to twist and people will try to use to teach work salvation. And really, Hebrews chapter number 6 is probably the most common chapter that is used. Not most probably. Within the book of Hebrews, it is for sure the one that people try to twist the most. So I want to uh, give you, uh, you know, what I believe to be the correct and proper interpretation and understanding of Hebrews chapter number 6 tonight. And I'm going to be spending more time on those particular verses probably than I am the rest of the chapter. So let's dive in. Hebrews chapter number 6 verse number 1 says this, Therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So I'm going to deal with the first three verses first here in Hebrews chapter number 6, verse 1, 2, and 3, because they kind of are you know, uh, stuck together here. They kind of have the same context. First, I want to remind you what Hebrews 5 was about. So there you notice that in Hebrews 6, verse 1, the first word is what? Therefore. Therefore, so because of what I just told you, therefore, it means consequently, right? So that means that it's tied in with what we spoke about, you know, it would have been two weeks ago, Hebrews 5. Now look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 10. It says this, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now who is that talking about? That's Jesus, right? It's talking about Jesus Christ. Then it says this, of whom? Jesus Christ. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered seeing ye are dull of hearing. So there are many things that he wants to teach the Hebrews about Jesus Christ, but he can't teach them because they don't understand it very well. They're dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. So notice he's talking about how you know, you should be teachers, but right now you're still a, you know, a babe in Christ, right? You need someone to teach you the first principles, the basics, the foundations, right? Then it says, uh, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even though those who by reason of use have their senses exercised. To discern both good and evil. So he's saying right now, you're like a babe in Christ. You're just learning the, the principles, the foundations. Now we get into verse number 1 of chapter 6 and he says, hey, we need to move on from that foundation. You need to start growing. You need to start moving forward in your Christian life. That's why he says in verse 1, so I wanted to remind you of the context. It's very important. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Remember he said, of whom, right? Of the doctrine of Christ. Let us go on unto perfection. Now, perfection there does not mean how we would usually use the word perfect, right? Like, like where there's no error. Perfection means complete. In this case, uh, uh, what it I would give you a perfect synonym in this context is maturity. That's what he's talking about. Right now, you're not mature. We need to move on to maturity, right? Because he's talking about a babe and you need to grow up and be an adult. That's what he's saying when he says perfection. And then he, he explains how we're going to do that. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So these are basic doctrines, right? The doctrine of Christ that are, doctrines of Christ that are basic. He's listing the first principles, right, of the oracles of God. Foundation. All of these words, uh, you know, uh, indicate that this is something very basic. 
The most basic doctrine is repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Right there you have a really good definition of what true repentance is. At the moment that a person gets saved, you know what you spend most of your time convincing them and trying to show them is your works are no good. You're not good enough to get yourself in heaven. You know what your works are? They're dead works. They're useless. They're vain. And you need to turn from that and trusting in your own works and put your faith in God. Now notice that it's repentance from dead works and faith toward God. So what was, what is it implying that your faith was in? Dead works. So notice what your faith was in and now it's in. It's, it's from the dead works, but now your faith is in God. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a foundational. This is actually the very first thing that you teach someone. That's why he lists. These are listed in the chronology of Christian growth. You'll notice that. Look at the next thing that he says. Of the doctrine of baptisms. Now that's still connected to uh, not laying again the foundation. Because it says not laying again the foundation of repentance. And then he's going to keep repeating this uh, adjective phrase. So it would go not laying again. Not laying again the foundation of repentance. And then you would go not laying again the foundation of the doctrine of baptisms. Right? So that's connected to that. So this is also a foundational doctrine. What is it? The doctrine of baptisms. Baptism is a basic doctrine. And also, you know, baptisms plural. Right? Right? But let's just think of just what the most common word uh, uh, or the most common uh, concept of the word baptism is used for is water baptism in the Bible the majority of the time. Now what happens after you get saved? You put your faith in God. What's the very first thing you're supposed to do? What's the very first thing that people do in the book of Acts? They put their faith in God, exactly, and then they're baptized. That's basic, isn't it? It's in the very beginning. You're still a babe in Christ when this happens. Look at the next thing. It says this, and of laying on of hands. Now, um, we'll come back to it, it real, uh, right after this. And of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Now, the laying on of hands, you could use that in a couple of different ways. But really, what I believe it symbolizes here, just in general, is someone going into ministry. What are you supposed to do after you get baptized? You're supposed to do works. You know, the laying on of hands represents a, a few different things in the Bible. People at the time of the apostles, they would lay on of hands and they would heal people. They would lay on of hands oftentimes and they would appoint them to a work. So uh, uh, you could look at this as the laying on of hands takes place uh, after baptism and it's a ministry. It's someone going into the ministry, going into work. They would do that work for God. They would do that after they're baptized. Then it says this, and of the resurrection of the dead. So that's later in your Christian life. After you're done working, after you're done with your ministry, it would be the resurrection of the dead. Then it says this, and of eternal judgment. So notice how there's a chronology there. There's clearly a chronology from starting at the very basic and at the very beginning of the Christian life. And it's talking about the basics of, if you were to do an overview of the Christian life there. And it ends with eternal judgment. These are all basic doctrines. You should understand the doctrines of the afterlife, eternal damnation or eternal paradise. You should know this. These are you know, uh, uh, doctrines that babes in Christ should know. So if you've been saved for many years, you should have a good grasp on all these things that are listed right here. And then it says in verse 3, And this will we do if God permit. Now I want you to turn over to James chapter number 4, verse number 13. This statement is actually more significant than you probably uh, uh, have noticed before. But the, this is a very, uh, this is a common statement in, in um, today's world. People will say this. I know his brother Hall says it pretty often. Like, we'll say, hey, I'll see you later. You know, and what will you say? If God will. So it's refer this is a statement that's referring to the fact that if God allows me to live longer, if God allows me to see my life, if God allows me to see you again, that's what that means in, he in uh, Hebrews 6, 3. And this will we do, saying we will move forward in our life if God will allow it, right? Now that is important. And I want you to look at James chapter number 4. And um, yeah, look at verse 12. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Now I want you to notice there that in this context it's talking about the, the punishment from God, isn't it? You notice that? Keep reading verse 13. Go to now ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Saying you don't know if you're going to have the next day, right? And he clearly says that in verse 15. A very similar statement to Hebrews 6. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. So notice it's a very similar statement to Hebrews chapter number 6, verse number 3. And he starts off the statement talking about there's one lawgiver who is able to save your life and to destroy your life. And it's in the context, Hebrews 4 
Hebrews 2 and 3, or I'm sorry, James 4, James 2 and 3 are in the context of the condemnation or the punishment of a Christian, of taking the life of a Christian, and so forth and so forth. So go back to Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 3. So what is the context so far in Hebrews chapter number 6? It's talking about a Christian growing. It's talking about a Christian moving forward in his Christian life. It's talking about a Christian, uh, uh, you know, enduring. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4, 5, and 6 is what we're going to look at now. And this is where the controversy comes in. And there's a lot of different opinions about what this is teaching. So we're going to read it quickly. And then I'm going to give you the three interpretations. I'm going to give you mine last. And I'm going to give you the first two. You know, uh, and go through them and critique them and show you why they are incorrect. Look at verse number 4. For it is impossible... For those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. So the impossible, of course, is saying that they cannot be renewed again unto repentance. Look at what it says next. Seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. So, interpretation number one, which, of course, we all know this is totally ridiculous and totally wrong. Not even close to being the correct interpretation. This is abused by many Pentecostals. This is probably one of the most famous verses that a Pentecostal, outside of James 2, I've had this quoted to me numerous times. I would assume that you probably have too. I've seen this used a lot in videos maybe on YouTube where they're trying to prove that you can lose your salvation. And that's what the Pentecostals will try to teach. That's what you know, many that believe that you can lose your salvation. They'll, they'll use this passage to try to say that it's teaching that you cannot, you know, uh, you can lose your salvation. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of problems with that. Now, the people that teach this, none of them believe and teach that you can lose your salvation and not get it back. Do everyone understand what I just said? They all believe that you can lose your salvation, you can be, you can be saved, become unsaved, and then get saved again. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? They all believe that. Well, if you take that type of, uh, of you know, interpretation of the, these three verses, that, you could, that it is talking about a loss of salvation, then what you also have to conclude is that this passage is teaching that you can never get your salvation back. And I'll show you that. Verse number four. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and, you know, and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. I don't want to read through all of this. They say, hey, that's a person that gets saved, right? Then they get down to verse 6 and they say, if they shall fall away. Now, to them, this is a person that's lost their salvation. They've, you know, you know jumped out of his hand like they like to say, right? They've rejected their salvation and they're no longer saved. That's what they say that this is teaching. If they shall fall away, but look at what it says to renew them again unto repentance. So if you take this interpretation and it's saying that you can lose your salvation, what is it saying that's impossible? To renew them again unto repentance. So if you believe, according to this passage, that it's saying that you can lose your salvation, what do you also have to believe? That if you lose your salvation, you can never get it back again. Now, there's not a single person, I don't think, in all of Christianity, any theologian anywhere that I've ever heard teach that. That you can lose your salvation and then never get it back again. I've never, and the reason why is because that would be a super bizarre teaching even in light of this scripture right here. Now, uh, furthermore, you couldn't twist any other verses in the Bible to even come close to saying that. It would be this isolated, weird interpretation just based on this one scripture. That's why there's no one anywhere that teaches it. So, if, if a person says that you could lose your salvation and they try to point you to this, well then just point them out like, hey, if you want to take that interpretation, it's impossible that they can't get, or it's impossible that, or, or let's say that this verse is teaching that they can lose their salvation. You also have to go further with it and, and understand and believe that it's saying that they, uh, it, it would be impossible for them to be resaved as well. You would have to take the whole package. It's like they don't really read verse 6. They're like quoting it to you. And they're trying to interpret it saying that you lost your salvation, but they're not really fully understanding what that would mean if you took that interpretation, right? So if you were to explain that to them, I'm sure they would say, no, 
I, I guarantee you, you can't find me. I challenge you to find me a person that says that this is teaching that you can lose your salvation and that you can never get it back again. None of them believe that. Pentecostals are huge on getting resaved, rededicating your life. And when they say rededicating your life, they're saying you're getting resaved, right? So that's not at all what they believe, but that would be, you know, the interpretation that they would have to take in its fullest, right? Now, the only person that I've ever heard go all the way with this and take that interpretation that I just told you is dispensationalists. So dispensationalists will use the book of Hebrews, of course, to say that, you know, this is a tribulation epistle and that this is written to those that are living during the period of the tribulation, right? And, and the gospel's different and salvation is, there's a different way of salvation during that time period. They actually teach this and they actually say that during that time period, salvation is by faith and works. And that if you lose your salvation, you can't get it back again. I don't know if you guys knew that or not, but that's what dispensationalists teach according to this passage. They actually go all the way with it and they say, yes, that's what it's teaching, you know, but that's not the way we're saved today. That's not what this is teaching anyways. It's stupid. It's silly. There's one gospel, the everlasting gospel. You know, there's only one way to get to heaven. It's through Jesus Christ. That's it. Period. It's through faith. Um, but... So that's interpretation number one. And there's two people that fall into that category. Those that are unsaved, uh, work salvationists who reject the gospel of grace, and then also hyper-dispensationalists. And many of them are saved. Uh, they just use these you know, interpretations, weird interpretations of passages like this to explain away scripture because they don't have the true interpretation of it. The second group is this. And this is what most people are going to be most familiar with, the interpretation in here. That this passage is teaching reprobation, right? And I'm going to show you tonight that that is not what this is teaching either. I'm going to demonstrate that a few different ways, clearly. And I'm going to show a few ways where this passage is lacking in order to teach that. Now, we believe in the doctrine of reprobation, that a person can become a reprobate, where they are rejected by God. But that doesn't mean that that's the interpretation of this passage. That doctrine is found in many other places, but that doesn't mean that this is teaching that. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? So... This is their interpretation. Let's go through this again with the second uh, 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 view of this passage. It says this, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Let's stop right there. Now this person uh, that would believe that this is teaching reprobation does not believe that this person is saved that's being described in verses 4 and 5. They believe that this is a person that's very close to salvation, a person that's heard the gospel many times. You know, they've tasted the gospel. It's on their lips or they've, they've, you know, they've heard it many different times, but they never actually received it fully. You know, and, that, and they would point to the word tasted. Like, you know, they haven't fully taken it in or to fully received it or fully swallowed it. And they would say, well, that means, you know, that they just, they just kind of, uh, you know, uh, they didn't receive it all the way. They just barely got a hold of it. It wasn't really theirs, right? They would also look at the verse, uh, partakers of the Holy Ghost. And they would say, well, you know, there are people in the Bible that, you know, partook of the Holy Ghost that weren't saved. And I've heard Caiaphas cited as an example of somebody who spoke, right, uh, who was moved by the Holy Ghost. And I'll explain that, the problem with that here in just a moment. Also, they would say... Uh, you know, where it says, those who were once enlightened. The first statement there. They would say, what does it mean to be enlightened? They would say, well, enlightened just means you understand something. So that doesn't necessarily mean you're saved. It means you just understand. So they would say, this is a person that understands the gospel, who was a partaker of the Holy Ghost. Maybe they were there. They spoke the word of God. They came to church all the time. They tasted it, meaning they were close to it, but they never received it. Right? I'm trying to sell it to you good now. I want you to understand what they say. Right? This is what they, how they interpret these verses. So it's a person that's not saved, but got very close to it. Then they would say in verse 6, it says this, If they shall fall away. Now that would be this person is not saved. They were close to salvation. They spent time with, you know, people, I just dropped my gum, people at church, right? And then they would say, they just drew back and they decided, you know, I'm rejecting i got to pick that up. I'm not stepping on that. Here, Michaela, catch. No, I'm just kidding. No, they would, they would say they just rejected it and they drew back and they've, you know, this is their final rejection of the gospel, right? And then they would say this, to renew them again under repentance. And they would interpret that as saying that that means that that person has finally been rejected by God now because they drew back, they fell away, they decided they didn't want the gospel. 
then you know they don't have an opportunity of repentance anymore. It's impossible for them to repent because it's impossible for them to now be saved. God has rejected this person. And they would point to verse number 8. It uses the word rejected. And then it says, and is nigh unto cursing. So that is uh, the second uh, uh, interpretation, right? They believe that it's te teaching reprobation. Now the Bible does teach, whether this makes you uncomfortable or not, whether you believe it or not, I don't care because the Bible don't care. The Bible teaches that there are people that cannot be saved. That there are people walking on the earth that God has rejected. They reject Him. He ultimately rejects them. That's true. That's a biblical teaching. Now, that makes people uncomfortable, so people don't like it because it makes them uncomfortable. Now, it doesn't matter whether or not it makes you uncomfortable. Sometimes, you know, I'm sure everyone in here has experienced this before, where something is true, and you know it's true, but it makes you uncomfortable and you're hesitant to receive that truth, aren't you? Just because it makes you feel weird. Now, why is that? You know, because we're conditioned by the world to think about things a certain way. You know, we're conditioned by the world, you know, that, that God loves everyone and would never do that to anyone. Is that coming from the Bible or is that coming from the world? So, the, the Bible teaches that there are certain people. You know, the Bible says, in the end times, it says that God shall send them strong delusion. That they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure on unrighteousness. I mean, that's as clear as day. He sent them the delusion so that they would believe a lie so that they would be damned. He wanted them to go to hell. These are people that rejected him over and over again and hated him. And he said, okay, you don't want me, you don't want the gospel, go to hell then. That's, what, that's the God of the Bible. You know, whether people don't like that or preach that anymore, it's the God of the Bible. I can show you scriptures on it. That's what you know, the Bible teaches. Now, so reprobation is true. But Hebrews chapter number 6 is not talking about a reprobate. And I'm going to demonstrate that to you very clearly. I'm going to begin by transitioning into the interpretation number 3 by debunking interpretation number 2. And I'm going to actually show you what it's teaching by showing you what it's not. You know, the Bible uses this contrast all the time uh, uh, method throughout the Bible. First off, I want to do this. I want you to notice, and we're going to go back to this scripture a couple of different times. I want you to notice that it says this in verse 4. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter number 10 real quickly. We're going to come back here in just a moment. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter number 10. It says this in Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 26. I don't want to read all of it because it's going to give the whole interpretation away if I do so. But it says in verse 26, Hebrews 10, 26, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. Now when we go back to Hebrews chapter number 6, verse number 4, that's what that's talking about when it says that they are enlightened. They have received the knowledge of the truth. That's what it means to be enlightened, to receive knowledge. You know, when you say, hey, I've been enlightened by that, what are you saying? I've received the knowledge. Now, everyone here I'm sure knows and believes that Hebrews... I've never met anybody who is once saved, always saved, Baptist, that thinks that Hebrews 10 is talking about a reprobate. No one believes that. It's clearly talking about a Christian. When it says they've received the knowledge of the truth, it's talking about a Christian. So, when it says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, it's talking about a person that has received the gospel. They're saved now. It goes on and says, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. One thing that's great about the Bible is you can always define words by the Bible. And not only by the Bible, but also within books usually. You can find your definition of a word within that very book. I want you to notice there where it says, and have tasted of the heavenly gift. Now I'm going to show you that tasted there doesn't mean you just put it on your tongue and then rejected it. But that you fully took part in this. Tasted of the heavenly gift. We're going to define it, the word tasted by the book of Hebrews. Go to Hebrews 2. Hebrews chapter number 2. Hebrews chapter number 2, look at verse number 9. The very last statement in, the verse, in uh, verse number 9, it says this. That he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. So notice that the word taste is used there in verse number 9. Now did Jesus just, Jesus just kind of take part in death? Did he just kind of try it and then pull back? Did he just kind of do it and then stop? No, he fully died. He 100% took part in death. So what does tasted mean there? Does the word tasted within the book of Hebrews defined as just barely doing something and then not completing it? No, it's defined as fully taking part in. Completely receiving and completely finishing and doing, right? Well, furthermore, it says there in verse number 4, it also said, and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Hebrews chapter number 3, verse number 1 says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Now, when it says partakers of the heavenly calling there, what is it referring to? 
He's referring, he's writing to them as, as they're Christians, right? Of course he has skepticism, right? He's, you know, and it makes perfect sense that they're babes in Christ, that you're not going to obviously mistake a person that's a full-grown Christian, really strong in the faith, for maybe not being saved. So the reason why he's, he's skeptical off and on about their salvation is because they're babes in Christ. Some of them are probably saved, some of them aren't saved. But he would still address them as, you know, partakers of the heavenly calling. That's saying that they're, these are saved people. He's writing to people that are partakers of it. They have it. It's not slightly. It's not almost. It's not a little bit. It's not just on their tongue and then they spit it out. They're fully saved. They're partakers of the heavenly calling. And verse number five, again, you know, I've already showed you verse, what tasted me. And it says this, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. So it just uses the word tasted twice. So there we've defined all the words in the book of Hebrews, and it's speaking of a Christian so far, right? Furthermore, what was verses 1, 2, and 3? Who were they speaking to? A Christian. We can't just rip verses out of context. It's talking about a Christian. It's talking about a person that's saved. It's talking about a person moving forward in their Christian life, right? Verse number 6 says this, If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. Now, this is the biggest problem with saying that it, this is talking about a reprobate. And this is what completely dismantles uh, that doctrine completely. There's no chance of it after this. And notice it says this, If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. What does the word again mean? To do something a second time. Now, when it says, renew them again unto repentance, what is it talking about when it says repentance? It's talking about salvation. Now, I'm going to first demonstrate to you a major error in, in logical consistency with the other interpretation. You may or may not have noticed this before. I, I, if you haven't thought about it a lot, I'm sure you haven't. What they do, and a big error with that interpretation, is they actually use the word repent in two different ways. And I'll, I'll demonstrate that to you. They use it with two different definitions. So notice it says, again, unto repentance. So in order for it to be again, that means that you're doing, listen to me, this is important, the same thing twice, right? Or it wouldn't be again. So obviously the word repent, it's only written one time in that verse, verse 5, right? verse 6. So it has the same definition. You can't use one, the same word one time and use two different definitions. I don't know if people are starting to process this or not, but think about this. It says that the, the, uh, the reprobate interpretation of this passage says that they're, they're, they fall away, but they can't be renewed again unto repentance. So what they would say is that the person can't be saved, right? That they've been rejected. So they're using the word repent about being saved and they're using the word repent to say that they can't be renewed unto repentance, right? So how are they, they interpreting the word repent that time? Think about that. As salvation. What is the repentance referring to? Salvation. Being saved, right? But what is their, what is their uh, uh, interpretation of it the first time? Because there's two times. Do they think that the person ever got saved? Think about that. They think that they got close to it, right? Everybody knows what I'm talking about? They got close to it. That's the demonstration that was used. But then they can't be renewed again unto repentance. So what they're doing is they're using the word repent in two different ways. They're saying that, they're, really they're saying that they didn't repent the first time or it's like a false repentance or it's like, you know, they got close to it and didn't actually receive it. But then the second time it actually is used as repentance and saying that they can't repent. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's a major failure in a consistency there when the word shows up once. But even putting that aside, that makes it more complicated because they're straining at a gnat trying to do that. And it, it, it's, it's a confusing way to explain it so it can go over your head easily. It says they cannot be renewed again unto repentance. So however you want to interpret this, the person has repented. Because it's saying they can't be renewed again unto repentance. So that means they've repented and it's saying that they can't repent again. They're not going to be able to. That right there alone destroys the fact that the person has never been saved. And especially if you're trying to use an interpretation to say that repentance there is referring to salvation, you're admitting that, whether you, whether you try to ignore it or not, that they already had repented. Right? So... The true interpretation of verse number 6 is this. 
If they shall fall away, this is a Christian, right, that has received the gospel. Think of a babe in Christ. That's who he's speaking to in the context and everything. A Christian that has fallen away. Now, what do we talk about a Christian that's backslidden? What have they done? They've went back into the world. They're obviously still saved. They obviously know and believe that Jesus is the Christ, that He is their Savior. But what do they do? They stop coming to church. They stop reading their Bible. They stop doing works for God. They just totally and 100% neglect and ignore the things of God. Wouldn't you agree that that Christian has fallen away from the faith? Now, are they still saved? Do they still know and have their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? How many times do you knock on the door of somebody that's saved as all get out, just as saved as you, and they're just like, yeah... Not really interested in going to church. Real laid back and they're like, uh, you know, I got other things that are more important to me. I mean, I talk to people like that all the time. Do you know what that Christian is? He's fallen away. A Christian is backslidden. He's stepped away from the things of God. That is what this is talking about. Now, let me ask you this question. Does, can that person, when they've fallen away like that, does that person get re-saved? No. Because once you're saved, you're always saved. Amen. You don't get re-saved. That's not how it works, right? So verse number 6 says, If they shall fall away, remember, it's impossible to renew them again unto repentance. Now, what does that mean? That's explaining that you don't get, you don't get re-saved. You don't get renewed again unto repentance. Now, the reprobation interpretation... Let me explain to you why that falls flat on its face for the second time. Because they ignore the second phrase in this verse that actually explains to you the first part. Notice what it says in verse number 6 next. Seeing. Now what does the word seeing mean in you know, uh, Elizabethan English or King James Bible English? It means because. That's what it means. Seeing. So it's saying like because. They crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. Now afresh just means again. They crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and notice this, and put Him to an open shame. Now, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, how many of your sins did He pay for, Brother Russell? All. So when you believed on Him, how many of your sins did He apply to you? Uh, uh, none of them, right? How many of your sins did He take care of? All. all of them. They're totally all gone, right? Now, if you had to get re-saved, what would that imply? That Jesus' blood wasn't strong enough to take care of all of your sins. That you would have to have Jesus crucified again. Now, doesn't that kind of downplay the blood of Christ? Doesn't it? Now, do you notice why it says they're seeing, there, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh? If you had to get re-saved, that would be saying that Jesus is basically being crucified for you again and He had to die for your sins once more. And then it goes on to say, and put Him to an open shame. Now, if that were the case, wouldn't that kind of be shameful? Wouldn't it be shameful that Christ's blood wasn't powerful enough to, to take care of all of your sins the first time? This goes with the theme of the book of Hebrews. The theme of the book of Hebrews is this. Let me simply uh, 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 state it to you. Jesus is better. Jesus is better than everything. The priesthood, he's better than the lamb sacrifice, he's better than the angels, he's better than man in Hebrews chapter 2. That's what the whole... Jesus' covenant, the new covenant, is better than the old covenant. That's the whole theme of the chapter of the book of Hebrews. The whole theme. So it's right now, I'm going to show you what it's talking about. It's talking about how his sacrifice is superior to the sacrifice of the blood of bulls and of goats. Now, repentance there was defined for us in chapter number 6, verse number 1. It, said, it says this, and foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. I want to show you specifically what those dead works are. Go to Hebrews chapter number 9. Hebrews chapter number 9. It says this in Hebrews chapter number 9, verse <clears throat> number 12. Neither by, the blood of uh, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood... He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained, watch this, eternal redemption for us. So it's comparing the two sacrifices. The blood of bulls and goats was what was sacrificed in the Old Testament. But now he's saying it's, it's his sacrifice and he was able to obtain eternal redemption for us. Saying once he, his blood is applied to us, it's eternally. Amen. We never need that again, right? It's just once and it's powerful enough to save us forever and to be an eternal uh, 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 sacrifice for us. Look at verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified through the purifying of the flesh, it only purified their flesh. It didn't save their soul. Look at what it said in verse 14. 
How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience? And then it says, from dead works to serve the living God. Now, I believe strongly that the dead works are referring to the sacrifices. Because in context, he's talking about those, be those works of sacrificing the animals. He's saying, you don't need that anymore. The, you know, Jesus' sacrifice is enough and it's superior to that. So it should purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now go back to Hebrews chapter number 6 once more. <clears throat> I want to read uh, verse 6 at the end there one more time. And I'm going to demonstrate to you all the different times, a couple other times in the book of Hebrews where it talks about how Christ's sacrifice is one time and it's not like how the, bull, the, the bulls and the goats were multiple times. So again, it says, Seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. What it's saying is that would be just like how you sacrifice the animals. That would be just like how you sacrifice the bulls and goats. And I'm going to demonstrate that to you. Go to Hebrews chapter number 9 again. Hebrews chapter number 9. Actually, uh, I'll just read to you. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 27 says this. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice. Notice that. They daily offered up sacrifice. Saying they had to continually sacrifice the bulls and the goats. It says, Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice. First for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Look at Hebrews chapter number 10 verse 1. Hebrews chapter number 10, verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. So it's saying that those, those sacrifices were never able to take away their sins. That's why they had to keep sacrificing them. And that's why it says that if, it were, if they were able to take away their sins, well then the, the, the sacrificer would have been once purged. He would have been clean and he wouldn't have had to keep sacrificing. So what that proves is that those sacrifices weren't good enough. That, or they would have just sacrificed it once and it would have been powerful enough to take away their sins. Now, with that in mind, look at verse 3. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance of again, again made of sins every year. They returned and had to sacrifice a sin offering every year, didn't they? Uh, the high priest had to offer that sin offering every year. What does that tell you about the blood of bulls and of goats? Was it able to take away their sins for eternally? It wasn't good enough, was it? They had to keep offering it, right? Look at verse, verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Verse 5. Wherefore... When he cometh into the world, that's Jesus, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. Saying, talking to God, saying, you don't want those, blood, those bulls and goats. You don't want those sacrifices. But a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Uh, and then he goes on, then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. The volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Verse 8. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Look with me, um, look with me at Hebrews. It is in Hebrews chapter 9. Look at also at Hebrews chapter number 9, verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now watch this. Nor yet that he should offer himself often. Now remember that phrase. What did it talk about? Him offering himself afresh or offering himself again. What is this saying? Does he offer himself again or offer himself often? He does not. Look at what it says. It says, For then must, I'm sorry, uh, Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Now watch this. But now, once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. How many times did Jesus Christ die? And, what, and how many sins did he pay for when he did that? All of them. Amen. The point of Hebrews 6, verse 6, is explaining you can't, when you sin, just go and get re-saved. 
When you sin, Jesus Christ doesn't, isn't re-sacrificed for you. In the Old Testament, when they sinned, they didn't get re-saved either. But you know what they did? Their repentance was going and offering that lamb. Their repentance was going and offering that sacrifice, not for salvation, but for their relationship with God. When we repent today, we of course just pray and I'm going to get into this, and all of that is going to make a little bit more sense to you in just a moment. We pray to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we, we plead the blood of, of the Lamb, basically. Right? And we can receive forgiveness in our life at, you know, in the sense of... Now, there's a difference, obviously. Our sins are eternally paid for as far as going to heaven. Right? right? But you still have a relationship with God while you're in this flesh. Right? We still have a relationship with God in heaven. And when you sin daily... God will punish you in the flesh. He will punish your flesh, right? Your soul is sealed and saved on the inside. Amen. But your, your flesh is still sinful. And that's why when you die, your soul leaves your body. And it's perfect. It's sinless. It's been sealed. It goes to heaven. But as long as your soul is in this flesh and you continue to sin, God's going to punish you in the flesh. God's going to continue to punish your body. When you sin, He's going to punish you for those things. Now, what do we do? Do we go and offer a sacrifice to fix that so we don't get punished in the flesh? What do we do? We would just pray to God and ask God because He is the sacrifice, right? And we would ask Him for forgiveness, right? As a son, you know, don't please, Lord, don't punish me for this. Give me forgiveness, right? Now, I wanna, this is going to become very relevant in just a moment. I want you to think about this. What has more importance? It's obviously a silly question because it's so obvious. What has more importance, the death of a lamb or the death of Jesus? Okay, so what do you think, you know, so if that has more significance or more importance, what do you think would be more dangerous? To sacrifice that lamb and then to just go out and keep sinning? Or to receive the sacrifice of Jesus and then to just go out and keep sinning? What do you think would make God more angry? Jesus, right? If His sacrifice being applied to you after salvation, and then if you just chose... You know, all my sins are paid for, right? And then you just lived however you wanted, right? Does everyone understand that? How there would be more significance to the uh, sacrifice of Christ? Go back to Hebrews chapter number 6. Now I'm going to explain uh, the next couple of verses in light of verse 6. So verse 6 is explaining that when you fall away, when a person falls away, Jesus doesn't die again for you. He doesn't, you don't get re-saved, right? You don't, you know, he's speaking to Jews that are used to, when they have sins, they go and offer an offering. He's saying it's not like that now. And if you did that, it would be like you were making Jesus die twice and his sacrifice is far superior to the lambs. He's only offered once, right? So, what do they do? Of course, they would just pray to God and ask God for forgiveness. They would plead the blood of the Lamb that is in heaven. He's our advocate. He's our mediator. We would just pray to Him directly. And He is the Lamb and the priest all in one, right? So that, that's a new, another doctrine that's kind of deep, and I don't want to get into all of that right now. But verse number 7 and 8 talks about the growth of a Christian in verses number 7 and 8. Verse number 7 talks about a Christian that actually does, does grow and does move forward and endure and has patience after salvation. That's what verse number 7 is about. Verse number 8 is about the Christian that falls away. The Christian that goes into the world, the Christian that uh, lives a life of vanity, of, you know, of thorns and briars or wood, hay and stubble. Now, Verse number 7 says this. We're going to read verse 7 and 8. It says this. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. Now people will see the word burn and they're like hell. Number one, this is an analogy. This is, this is a metaphor. And you know what the metaphor of the analogy is? It's of earth. It's of the ground, right? And he's saying this ground over here brings forth fruit, and this ground over here does not bring forth fruit. There's another analogy like this in Matthew chapter number 13, the parable of the sower. And there is one ground. He actually says ground there. It's the same thing as earth. And he talks about how he plants the seed. The seed is the word of God. The, there's one that brings forth fruit. 
Everyone would agree that that one's saved, right? That's a, that's a person that received the Word of God and they're saved. There's other ones also, and there's one in particular that bears or is, is choked by thorns and briars in that same ground. Everyone here would also agree that they're saved, right? It's an analogy, right? So, so we realize that. Now, when it talks about burning it, what are, what are they burning? Thorns and briars. Why do you burn thorns and briars? Because they're useless. The exact word. They're vain. They're useless. They're, you can't, they, they have no value. That's what it is. That's why it's talking about thorns and briars. It's a Christian that lives a vain life of thorns and briars. Now, why does it say cursing? Because that's what happens when a Christian lives a disobedient, vain life. They are cursed. When the children of Israel, before they went into the land of Canaan, they're, you know, this is God's people. And they stood there and he said, after he gave them the law, I set before you this day life and death, blessing and cursing. It's talking about God's people. And if you transgress God's law, God will curse you. He will punish you. And you know what he gives them? A big list, a big long list of cursings that will happen in this life. If they were saved, they're still, they'd still receive those cursings. When they die, they went to heaven. There was a lot of saved Israelites that received cursings and got carried away into Babylon. A lot of them. You know, and there, there's a big long list of all different types of diseases, pestilence, horrible things. Those are cursings from God. You know, and the thorns and the briars, they also represent cursings of the earth, of the ground, right? What happened when the first sin came into the world? It brought forth thorns then and briars. It's harder to, you know, to, to, uh, uh, agri um, uh, to plow the land. Cultivate is the word I was looking for. Cultivate the land then, wasn't it? Why? Because of sin. This is a Christian that's living a sinful life. The cares of this world. Deceitfulness of riches. A vain, meaningless life. You know what's going to happen? They're going to receive cursings in this life. But not only that. All they're bearing is thorns and briars. A bunch of useless junk. And do you know what's going to happen with all of it? It's all going to be wasted. Because remember, the world, it represents the world. It's going to be burned up. Now I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. And I'll show you a perfect parallel with this. And I'm going to show you, and I believe this also testifies to the fact that Paul wrote this letter again. Because you see the same train of thought. Hebrews chapter number 5 ended about talking about a babe in Christ. Ended about talking about somebody who's on the milk of the word, right? Then he goes into the idea of a Christian growing. There's the Christian that does grow. Then there's the Christian that doesn't grow. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is identical. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. And Paul is, of course, the author. Verse number 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto, even as unto babes in Christ. Notice the same context. Look at what it says next. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now you are able. So... Uh, one kind of side point, I believe this further proves that Paul is the author. You can see he's the one that uses this analogy. Peter uses it one time too, but Paul uses it one other time in addition to this. But it's also the same train of thought. Because he continues to go on here. He's talking about them being babes in Christ. And then he goes on to talk about how he wants them to grow. He even likens it unto you know, someone getting saved by a seed. He talks about that. Some One person plants the seed, another person waters, right? God gives the increase. That's the person by whom it is dressed receiveth blessing from God, right? Look at verse number, uh, <clears throat> look at verse number 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Verse number 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. So, when a person gets saved, they have the foundation that's laid of Jesus Christ. No man can change that, that foundation and no man can lay a new foundation. That's what that's explaining. Once that rock is laid, once you're trusting in Christ, you're saved. That's a foundation that cannot be moved. That's what he's explaining. It can't be changed. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Now, people will build upon that salvation. Everyone, every Christian that is saved has the foundation of Jesus Christ and every one of them is building upon that foundation. Every one of them. Every single one of them. Some of them are building things of worth. Some of them are building things that don't have value. Those that are maybe going to church, that are doing soul winning, that are reading their Bible, that are you know, uh, ministering unto the sick, doing things that are works of God, they're building good things. Things of value on, on that foundation. People that are 
spending their life with vain things, things that don't matter, you know, sinful things, drunkenness, parties, bars, you know, just money, obsessed with just, you know, living a life of, of just uh, uh, vanity and things like that, they're building too. Wood, hay, and stubble. So you're either putting on the foundation gold, what's the other silvers? Gold, silver, and precious stones, or you're building wood, hay, and stubble. Now, does wood, hay, and stubble sound familiar? Maybe like thorns and briars? See how that's, and what is that, the, the, the wood, hay, and stubble? What is it? Is it a value? Exactly. This is all their, their, their uh, works. All of this are their works. All of these things are their works. But is it of value? None. It's not a value at all. You know what you do think with things that aren't of value? You burn them. Look at verse number 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest. Saying every person that's saved, one day their works are going to be made known. We're going to see you know, what they've done for God. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So notice he teaches here that fire is going to try your works. Right? Look at what it says next. So it's going to, it's going to burn your works. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, so he has the foundation, and if you built it and your works stay, that's what abide means, they stay, he shall receive a reward. So notice that if your works stay, you'll receive a reward. What does that mean? What would stay? Gold, precious stones, silver. What happens when you burn the metals? Things that have value. They purify. They become brighter and better, don't they? You get rid of the dross, the crappy stuff, right? All the junk. It cleans it. But they don't, they don't disappear, do they? Because they have value. Right? They're not vain. Look at what it says in verse 15. Further, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Now, what does it mean burned? Saying it's going to be burned up. You're going to lose it. Like what? Wood, hay, and stubble. You know what else like? Another thing you can call it is thorns and briars. You know what would happen? Their works would be tried, their works would be burned, and they would be burnt up and they would suffer loss. What are they going to lose? Rewards. That's what they're going to lose. They would lose rewards. Look at what it says next. Um, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, watch this, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. This is a great verse to, to also show that you can be a Christian and live just whatever kind of life you want, but you'll still be saved. You, will, you can live the, you know, the worst life and a life of vanity, you're going to be cursed, you're going to get to heaven and not have any rewards, and there's going to be people with tons of rewards with gold and precious stones and silver, and you're just going to be there with nothing for all eternity. You don't get another shot at it. You know, you, you know once the game's over, the game's over. But if the man has builds wood, hay, and stubble, just lives a life of vanity, doesn't do anything for God, he's going to stand there, his works are going to be burned up, and then he alone walks away. That's sad, man, too, by the way. That's a, that's a scary, sad thought. I mean, let that set in in your mind. You live on this earth for, what, 70, 80 years? 90 years, maybe? You die, you're dead forever. So whatever you take with you after you walk away from that day that he talks about here is what you're going to have for all eternity, forever. If wood, hay, and stubble gets burnt up, number one, you're going to see that really didn't have much value of the life that you lived. You're like, where'd it go, man? I spent all my time doing that. Or you could walk away with great rewards. Gold, precious stones, silver that you keep for all eternity. Amen. Obviously that represents you know, God giving glory upon us too. But it says he would be saved yet so as by fire. Notice the strong consistency. Notice the wood, hay, stubble, the thorns, the briars burnt up. Now when we go back to Hebrews chapter number 6, what you have in verse number 7 is a Christian that receiveth blessing from God. A Christian that brings forth fruit that receives blessing from God. In verse number 8 you have a Christian that bears thorns and briars. A Christian that lives a life of sin, so they receive cursings in their life. They live a life of vanity, that they're just building wood, hay, and stubble, and thorns and briars. And you know what happens? It's all burn up. It's all a waste. It's all just a, a waste of their life. Now, doesn't that make perfect sense? It compares Scripture with Scripture, even with outside of the book of Hebrews, it makes perfect sense. But furthermore, I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter number 10, and I want you to notice the strong, strong consistency here in Hebrews chapter number 10. Look at verse number 26. For if we sin willfully, 
after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. Now, sinning willfully is falling away. It's a person turning away, you know, uh, uh, you know, sinning in their life and just living whatever life that they want after they know better. It says... For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. That's the person that's been enlightened. That's the person that is a partaker of the Holy Ghost. Tasted the good word of God. The powers of the world to come. You know, tasted of, what was the other one? The heavenly gift. Watch this. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. You see that? You notice what he just said? The person that sins willfully, it says, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Why? Because you can't crucify the Son of God afresh. You can't crucify the Son of God a second time. It's saying you can't be, in that sense, renewed again under repentance. You can't just go back and just, ha let's just sacrifice the lamb one more time. Let's just have, you know, the lamb sacrifice one more time. It doesn't work like that. Now it's the blood of Christ. It's no longer the lamb that's the purifying of the flesh. It's the blood of Christ that's purifying of the flesh. So what do you think would be the result of that? How, how high is the value of the blood of Jesus, of the blood of God? So, what, so, so which do you think would receive a bigger punishment? The man that does despite unto the blood of a lamb or the man that does despite unto the blood of Christ? Not, you'd be cursed pretty heavily, wouldn't you? I'm not going to go to hell, but you would receive a serious punishment pretty heavily, wouldn't you? If you just got saved and then just turned around knowing that that's what cost him on the cross. Think about that. Even the sins that you, you, know, even the sins that you commit in, in the future in your life, Jesus paid for them. You know, God is not this... God knows what sins in the end of your life that you're going to commit. But you still have free will and you can take a couple of stripes off his back. You understand what I'm saying? You can cause him to pay for less sins in that sense, depending on the way you decide to live your life going forward. And if you just live in filth, you know what you're saying? Give him another one. Think about that. Go ahead. My pleasures are more worth it. I'd rather you know, live this life than, than, than try not to, than, than uh, you know, uh, try to uh, um, you know, save Jesus a little bit of punishment. Think about that. And keep that in mind when you read the next couple of verses. So, verse 26 again. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Now watch this. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Now, fiery indignation. It's not Again, people won't misunderstand this too. It's saying his anger is fiery. It's not saying there's fire there. Fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. When it says devour the adversaries, that's like, like, it doesn't have to be fire burning something up. And the reason why I say that is because the next verses don't talk about fire and it gives you an example of this exact punishment. Look at verse 28 of a punishment type uh, like that. It says in verse 28, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So those that despised Moses' law and just didn't care about the old covenant, yeah, we'll just sacrifice another lamb, they were punished pretty severely, weren't they? Some of them would die without uh, uh, mercy under two or three witnesses. Look at verse 29. Of how much sorer punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. You know what that is? That's a severe, a severe warning to a Christian that gets saved and then falls away. A Christian that gets saved and just decides to live a sinful life. There remains no more sacrifice for sins. Do you know what comes next? A punishment. And, and yeah, there were cases where in the Old Testament where they would receive mercy and grace from God. Where they'd sacrifice the lamb and God wouldn't kill them maybe in their life. You know, David received mercy. You know, uh, there's all types of situations where people would receive mercy, right, from God. It's possible God may give you mercy if you sin against Him now, afterwards. But do you know what else is real possible? You might receive a very severe punishment. And I can promise you this, that if you were to commit the same sin under the Old Covenant, that you commit under the New Covenant, this is what this is trying to uh, embed in your mind. You'll receive a lot, lot worse punishment. What Hebrews chapter 10 and Hebrews chapter 6 is trying to do is warn the Christian very severely 
about living a life of sin after they got saved. He's trying to write to, go back to Hebrews chapter number 6, write to babes in Christ, Christians that got saved, who right now they're on a, 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 a tottering, they're, they're tottering right now, and they, and they are you know, in between, uh, they're in a, in a twix between two, where they could go two ways. They could go back to the world and live a sinful life, where they could become planted and mature and grow forward. And he's warning them, you want to live that life, it's, there's going to be repercussions. You're going to be cursed by God. There's going to be serious punishments. There is no more sacrifice for your sins. You can't crucify the Son of God afresh. It's just going to be severe punishment from God at this point. So he's warning them about curses from God. He's also warning them about a life of vanity, thorns and briars. Further proof of that this is talking about works, not talking about salvation. Look at verse number 9. We're going to keep going now. We need to kind of hurry up. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. Now watch this. And things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. So he says, though we thus speak. What is he saying? We're talking about things that accompany salvation. What does that mean? Are we talking about salvation? No, we're talking about things that accompany salvation. That means things that come with salvation. Right? Does that make sense to everyone? Uh, though we thus speak, right after the phrase uh, accompany salvation proves that what that was just about was things that accompany salvation. What accompany salvation? Think of 1 Corinthians 3. He had works there. Saying that we don't think that you're just going to be saved yet, yet so as by fire, but we think that you will grow. We think that good things will come from you and you won't just bring forth thorns and briars, but you'll actually bring forth gold, precious stone, and silver. So it's not about salvation. It's about things that accompany salvation. Things that come with salvation, which is what? Works. Now, does it have to? No, he's saying, I think that you will have the things that accompany salvation. That's what he's saying. Look at verse 10. Further proving it's about your works, not about your salvation. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward His name. So notice, talking about their works, right? The things that accompany salvation, their works. He's not unrighteous to forget those things. Um, which you have showed toward His name, in, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Verse 12. That ye be not slothful. What does slothful mean? Lazy. Right? He's saying he doesn't want you to be lazy. Now, what does a lazy person not do? Work. Right? He's talking about works. He's saying we don't want you to be slothful. Now, I want you to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 24. Real fast. Let's go there fast. Because I don't have much time left and I want to get... I want to uh, still uh, diligently go through the remaining of the chapter, but we're going to have to do it fast, so pay attention. Proverbs 24, look at verse 30. I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding, and lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. So notice that strong connection between the verse there in Hebrews 6, verse 12, where it talks about it. We don't want you to be slothful. What is he saying? We don't want you to just bring forth thorns and briars. We don't want you to be a lazy Christian. That's what we're saying. Don't be a lazy Christian where, where your, your, your earth, your ground, just bears thorns and briars and nothing else. Right? You see this strong consistency from the beginning of the chapter to the end of the chapter? Then he says, But followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So he's saying, You're saved. You have faith. I want you also to have patience. Patience is talking about having works. I'm going to show you that. The word patience in the King James Bible does not just mean like what we think of patience of like when a person is waiting patiently. That is a, it is a different uh, uh, definition in the Bible. The word patience in the Bible actually means to endure. And I'm going to show you. I want you to go to James. James 5. James. The book of James is the very next book after Hebrews. James chapter number 5. The last chapter of the book of James. Look at verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. So notice the word patient. Look at verse 8. Uh, be ye also patient. Notice that. Verse 9. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Verse 10. Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. So there's patience spoken of, right? A few different times. So he's saying, take them. He's saying, I want you to be patient. You need to be patient. And then he says, hey, use the prophets of the Old Testament for an example of being patient. So they're patient, right? He's going to show us an example of someone that was patient. Look at verse 11. Behold, we count them happy, which, watch this, endure. 
So what does the word patient mean? Endure. He said, take them for an example which have patience. And he says, behold, we count them happy which endure. Instead of using the word patience. Further proof of that, look at verse 11. Further. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. So he uses the word endure and patience interchangeable there. And you can see that the word patient actually means to endure. What's the whole book of Hebrews about? Endure. Have patience. He uh, we're going to get into this even more and more later on in the book of Hebrews where he's telling them to endure, have patience, continue on, grow. What's the Hebrews chapter 6 about? Grow as a Christian. Move on into perfection. Don't be slothful. Move forward. That's why he says, have faith and patience. So you're saved. You have the foundation. Don't just sit there with thorns and briars. Actually bring forth fruit. Actually bear forth uh, bear fruit and do something in your Christianity. I'll further prove that's the definition by Hebrews 6 itself. Go back to Hebrews 6. Look at verse 15. We'll go back and read the verse that we missed there, but look at verse 15. And so after he had, watch this, patiently endured. So what does it mean there? It means to endure. The word patient has a connotation of enduring and not only just waiting, not just sitting there and waiting, it actually means to endure. Look at verse number uh, 12 one more time. So it says, That ye be not slothful, like not doing work, but followers of them who through faith and patience, saying faith and they weren't slothful, faith and pa patience inherit the promises. Now, Hebrews chapter number 6 is actually teaching eternal security. And we're going to see that even more in the next chapters. Because remember, what is it teaching? That sacrifice already took away all your sins. You can't just have it sacrificed for you again. You're saved. There is no going back and repenting again. Once you're saved, you're always saved. And what happens is you can't just start your Christian life over. If you get saved and you decide to live a sinful life, you're going to be punished for that. If you just turn from God completely, God tries to warn you over and over again, God is going to punish you little by little, but then ultimately, oftentimes like we see in the Bible, people will receive severe punishments, very serious punishments, where their baby dies, they die. Look at Saul, for example. That's a good example of somebody being rejected. He actually says that Saul was rejected. Was Saul saved? Yes. He got to a point where there was no more opportunity. It didn't matter what he did. It didn't matter what would happen. He's a perfect example of a Christian that bared forth thorns and briars, was rejected and nigh unto cursing. His life was basically vain, wood, hay, stubble after that. He wasted his Christian life, right? And he received serious uh, punishments. He ended up dying because of it. The, the rest of this chapter is actually going to motivate the Christian to, to bring forth fruit by uh, um, you know, uh, explaining to them their eternal security. That they're never going to lose their salvation. He tries to motivate them to endure because you are saved. Because the fact that we can never lose our salvation, we need to you know, add to our faith patience and endure. I'm going to show that to you. Look at the very next verse. Verse 13. For, for, well, let's read verse 12 quickly. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So we need to follow someone. Again, he's going to give us an example of someone who, who didn't only have faith, that's important, but he also had patience. That means he endured and had works too. Look at verse 13 now. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, surely... Blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. So this was the promise that was given to uh, 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 Abraham. And it's a promise because he says, surely, right? He's saying, this is going to happen. Surely, certainly. This is God promising that he will receive the blessing, right? And he had, and we know that this was in, what is it, Genesis 12? He puts his, or Genesis 15. He puts his faith in God, right? He's saved. But he didn't only get saved and have faith, he also had patience. He also endured and had works after that. Look at what it says in verse 15. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. So notice it's pointing out the fact that he had faith, but he also patiently endured and he obtained the promise. Now, what's interesting about this, I don't have a lot of time to build this, but Hebrews chapter 11 verse 13 tells you that these all died in faith not having received the promises. You notice what this just said? After he had patiently endured, he received the promise. Because there's a double meaning. In Hebrews 11.13, what is the promises there? It says that they saw them afar off. So they received the picture, right? They received the current physical promise, 
like how the children of Israel went into the promised land, but they didn't actually receive the real promise, the real thing. He received the promise of what? His Isaac being born, the son being born, right? That actually came to fruition on this earth and in his life. He patiently endured and then that took place. But, but did he, while he was there, actually get to see Jesus and all of those things? No, that's what it's explaining. He wasn't here for that, right? So it says, uh, And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Verse 16, For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. So it's saying when men promise... What they do is they swear by the greater, right? So you would say, right, I swear to the Lord that this, this, and this would happen, right? You would make that promise and you would swear by someone greater because he is of a greater value. And if you were to swear by him, you're of course saying, I'm never going to break this promise. This is true, right? But if you swear by, let's say if you swear by yourself, does it have as much meaning? Does it carry as much weight? Of course not. So it's saying when men swear, they swear by the greater. Look at the next statement. And an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. And the fact that it's an oath like, hey, I promise, or hey, I swear, that should end all of the fighting. Like, I am going to do this. And they're like, are you sure? And you're like, I promise. All right. That's what that means, right? An end of all strife. Now watch this, verse 17. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. Now that's a mouthful, but I want to explain that to you. It says this. So, in, in, spite of, in, in, in light of everything that we just talked about, in lieu of everything that we just talked about, it says, wherein God, willing more abundantly, even more so abundantly, to show unto the heirs of promise. Now these are saved people. That's what's important about understanding this is about eternal security. He wants to show to the people that are saved the heirs of the promise. They're already heirs. An heir means you're going to receive the inheritance. You are a son of God is what it's saying. And he wants to show to you, it says, the immutability of his counsel. Now, does everyone here know what the word immutable means? Everyone know what the word mutation means? The word mutation means to change, right? To mutate. If you put an I-M on the front of it, it means the opposite. Like perfect, and then if I said imperfect, what does that mean? Not perfect. It, it, it's a negating prefix, prefix, excuse me, causes it to mean the opposite. So immutable means it can't change. To mutate means to change. When he says it's immutable, it's saying it'll never change. So it's saying that wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise, the saved, the people that did actually receive, that are partakers of the Holy Ghost. They, are, they have tasted of the, of the heavenly gift, gift. These are saved believers, heirs, right, of the promise. The immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. So he, just because he wanted to make sure that the person receiving the promise, the person who gets saved and receives the gospel, that this is a promise of heaven and all of these things that come with it, he wanted to make sure that they understood for them that you, this, it, this can never change. This is a promise that can never change. It will never change. It's immutable. It says that he confirmed it by an oath just so that you would know that once you receive this, you're an heir. You're an heir of the promise. And it's immutable. It's never changing. What is he trying to do right now? He's trying to tell you have patience, build upon your faith with your patience. Why? Because in heaven you have an enduring substance that will never change. You have a promise that has been given to you of heaven. And, you know, you know I have not seen nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for him. You have all these great things in heaven. You know what you should do because of that? When you actually understand, wow, I'm eternally secure. I can never lose my salvation. There's nothing that I can do to change the promises of God. You know what you should do? You should serve God even harder. Amen. You should work even harder. You should just devote your life knowing that in heaven you have an enduring substance. You have a mansion in heaven. Amen. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. You know, he, he built us a place in heaven. He has a mansion for us in heaven. Isn't that motivating? It's even more motivating the fact that I can never lose my salvation. Right. It's even more motivating to go soul winning, to start serving God, to read my Bible, that I know that God cannot lie. If I thought, hey, I'm not very sure about God's promises, 
Do you think you'd, you, you, would, you would really want to you know, put all your eggs in that basket? If you thought maybe you could lose your salvation, don't you think that it would maybe make you think, like, I don't know. So what's the point wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. Look at verse 18. That by two immutable things, so two things that are unchangeable, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge <clears throat> to lay hold upon the hope set before us. So there's two things here. Number one, the fact that God says it already makes it immutable because he can't lie. The Bible says in Titus 1-2, in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So the fact that God said it, it's immutable. If God says it, it's going to come to pass. Because God is perfect, God is sinless, God cannot lie, that is immutable. But he did another thing on top of that. So two immutable things this says, and what is that? He confirmed it by an oath. That's the other part. He Even more abundantly, on top of the fact that he doesn't lie, it should be good enough, but he wanted to show it for us. So that you would add unto your faith patience. So that you would endure. He said, you know what? Just to give you a strong consolation, I'm going to confirm it by an oath. And he made a promise. He made a vow. Why? That's how much more God wants you to do works in your life. Amen. Think about that. That's how much God wants you to serve him. He made that promise for you. And he said, I'm going to confirm it. You know what? Abraham, you know what, mankind? I know that this will help you do more for me. So I'm going to make it a vow also. I'm going to make it an oath also. So that you'll do more. And notice what it says. <clears throat> that we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. You can have a strong consolation. This is all about eternal security. You can't be renewed unto, again under repentance because he's only crucified one time. And, and it's all paid for. All of it is about patiently enduring. Starts off Hebrews 6, verses 1 through 3. And he tells them, move on from this. Grow. Bring forth fruit. And then he says, and this will we do if God permit. For, that means because. He goes on to explain, there's two things that happen after this. Either you bring forth fruit or you don't. And if you don't, you know, who's to say whether you're going to live any longer? Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. He's giving you a warning when he says, and this will we do if God permit. If you decide to live a sinful life and a wicked life afterwards and you don't add patience unto it, you're going to receive cursings. You're going to receive punishment from God. You're going to receive, you know, uh, uh, you know, it just all different times. You know, there's, you go to 1 Corinthians 11 and read the end of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11. There are tons of different punishments. For this cause, many are sick, you know, weak, and, and, and he says, and many sleep. There are many that are dead too. If we were to judge ourselves, you know, then God wouldn't have to judge us. There's punishments that come with a disobedient life. And then, you know what? Really the worst thing is stepping into eternity with nothing. Just you. I'm not satisfied with that. Just being saved. Yeah, you know, people may look at that and say, well, at least I'm saved. Yeah, I'm happy I'm saved and I'm super grateful for my salvation. But you know what? I have a strong consolation. And, and you know, I'm thankful that he made that oath and that vow. And it's even more immutable, more abundantly shows unto the heirs of salvation that it's never going to change. And I'm just racking up, you know, uh, treasures in heaven, building up my rewards in heaven. Amen. I'm going to try to put as much gold and precious stones and silver that I can. I remember right when I started going soul winning, like, like you know, probably, man, I'm 30 years old. It would have been t 22. I was 22 years old right when I really started going soul winning. I went with my cousin, Ryan Irvin. And uh, he goes to, he's a big ruckman. I went to my cousin's church, uh, it's Bible Baptist. <clears throat> I went soul winning with him. He preached the gospel. He got some guy saved. And we were walking out. I don't know if you guys have heard this story before. And I remember this like it was yesterday. And he was like, me and you, we just got a little golden nugget for our crown. And then he just turned and kept walking. And I was thinking like, what in the world are you talking about? I didn't fully understand like these rewards. He was joking when he said golden nugget. You know, the way he was wording it was meant to be a joke. But, it, but it's, it's true to a degree. You know, I, mean? I took part a little bit in that. I was there, you know. 
I was the partner. You know, I wasn't able to do very much, but I was there. I'm sure I get something for it. Come on! No, I'm just kidding. But, I, you know, we receive rewards for these things. Amen. The real, like, uh, everything that you do matters. Right. Everything. Wood, hay, or stubble. Or gold, precious stone, silver. There's a foundation, and it says, and every man's building on it. It's not that some people aren't building and some people are. You're putting things on this. On the, and it's even embarrassing the fact that they're there. You're going to stand and look at them. And can you imagine the Apostle Paul standing there with his foundation and what his looks like? And then you have like King Saul. What do you think it looked like? Compare the two. That's embarrassing, isn't it? And it's going to be tried by fire. You know what, what happens? King Saul walks away. Maybe he has some rewards. I don't know exactly how it works. God's, you know, that's obviously precision, you know, justice. He's an exactor. Saul walks away, let's say, with nothing. The fire burns and Paul, you can't see Paul while the fire's burning. And then Paul walks out with just tons of rewards. That's what I want. I want I, and then you know what? Like I said, it, you know, you need to think this concept through in your mind. When you walk away with your rewards, that's what you walk away with forever. You know, we don't put any more minutes back on that clock. When the buzzer rings, it's over. When you breathe your last breath, whatever you accumulated on this earth, that's what you take with you. And that's it. Into eternity. So your life here, you better decide whether the vanity's worth it. Whether that wood, hay, and stubble's worth it. Whether you just want to grow thorns and briars all your life. Or, you're at, or do you want to grow on, unto perfection? You want to grow up and be a big Christian and be an adult and do things that, are, that have value. Do things of value. Like Paul said, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. You know what he put away? Thorns and briars. Vanity, stupid things, video games, whatever you want to talk about. It's all pointless. It's all dumb. You know, some's worse than others. Some, you know, is, is uh, uh, just plain out sin. It's also vanity. But even still, I want to live a life that's actually accumulating something. I want to live a life. You know, you say, oh, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't want to have rewards in heaven. Oh, really? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, so run that ye may obtain. It's, it's set before us so that we will endure. He wants us to endure. He wants us to bear fruit. He wants us to bring forth fruit and to bring forth herbs by whom it is meat, by whom it is dressed. He wants us to. God wants us to earn rewards. He receives glory by it. Um, also, if you're interested in another parallel passage to further proof the interpretation of uh, prove the interpretations of Hebrews 6, 8, John chapter 15 uses almost the exact same interpretation. He's speaking to his disciples. He tells them, hey, if you abide in me, if a man abides in me, he'll bring forth fruit. If he doesn't, he's as a branch cast forth into the fire and burned. You know what it means? You're useless. You're not helping me. You're not helping the, the, the things of the kingdom of God. You know, the reprobate interpretation of Hebrews 6 is laughable. It's ridiculous. It's not even close to what this teaches. You can parallel this with passage after passage. It's consistent within the book of Hebrews. It's clearly the interpretation of the passage. Yeah. What catches people off guard is the burned, you know, the rejected. Rejected is used about Saul. Cursing is, ta is talked about in the book of Hebrews about Christians being cursed and, and, and receiving punishment. Children of Israel. It's super clear. The, this same par uh, parable is used about Christians over and over again. Matthew 13, John 15. Thorns and briars, wood, hay, and stubble. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but it's super clear. Let's read these rest of these verses. Also, you can look at Numbers 35, because that's actually a reference also in Hebrews 6, verse 18, when it says, Who have fled for refuge to lay hold. That's a reference in the Old Testament to the cities of refuge. He's writing to a Jewish audience. He's writing to a Hebrew audience, and they're familiar with the Old Testament. That's why he can casually just make all these mentions. He's talking about us fleeing for refuge. So you know what the cities of refuge represent? Presented Jesus Christ. That was the they all all these have pictures and things like that, and it represents the Lord Jesus Christ, the man fleeing for refuge. Whether he had, was guilty or not guilty, he went in still. Think about that for a minute. Look at verse 19. Which hope we have, that's talking about Christ, as an anchor of the soul, saying it's sure, watch this, both sure and steadfast, 
and which entereth into that within the veil. Uh, only the high priest was allowed to go into the veil. And it's talking about Jesus Christ as our high priest going in and making intercession for us. He loves us and on our behalf he was making intercession for us to please God and was offering that sacrifice. Of course he didn't offer the lamb as a sacrifice, he offered himself. So it's again referring to him as our high priest making intercession for us to, to bring us back to, to God. Verse 20, whither the forerunner is for us entered is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the Mil after Mil after excuse me, the order of Melchizedek. Notice he's called the forerunner. What does the forerunner mean? Right. So you know who goes in after? You. Because he made a way for us to be able to go in. Whither it says the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus. He's the forerunner. He goes in first. But now we can approach the, the, the throne of God boldly, the Bible says. So after he went in and he did all that for us, he made us kings and priests. Because we now, everything that Christ did in his life and all of Christ's identity is uh, uh, imputed unto us. And because of that, once he sprinkled that blood, it's a done deal. The new covenant, and I'm in that new covenant, it's a done deal. His whole life, his righteousness... All of his identity. You know why you're a son of God? Because he's a son of God. Do you know why you're a king? Because he's a king. You know why you're an heir? Because he's an heir. Do you know why you're a high priest or a priest? Because he's a priest. So you can enter in. That's why it talks about... And look back at verse chapter 4, verse 16, and we're finished after this. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help of time of need. Notice what you're allowed to do. Come boldly unto the throne of grace. He's our high priest. He goes in first. And he made a way for us. He brought us back to Christ. He did everything that we need him to do. That's why he's referred to as our forerunner. Hebrews chapter number 6 is about enduring. It's not about reprobate. It's definitely not talking about losing your salvation. It's actually teaching eternal security. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for everything you've done for us. We thank you for, God, the promise and making it and showing that it's two immutable things and making it more abundantly sure, dear God. Uh, we're thankful that we have a God that cannot lie. We're thankful for the power of God's Word. We're thankful for you know, your promises. Uh, we're thankful for so many things, dear Lord. We ask you that you bless this church, bless everybody in it, all the families and, and, uh, and uh, individuals that have showed up tonight. Uh, just continue to bless us. Dear God, help us not to be the Christian of, of vanity and, and, and wood, hay, and stubble. We've already lived enough of that in our lives. Help us to turn and change our lives and and this point forward, help us to just to, even more so than we have in the past, to dedicate our lives and to uh, try to build uh, gold, precious stones, and silver upon that foundation. We love you and we thank you for the sacrifice. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.